This lesson is a look at the structure of the Linux file system. You should never have to deal with a file system at this low a level, but if you understand how it's put together, a lot of the things that you will have to deal with will make more sense. For example, if you're creating a file system, you may be asked how many inodes you want. The usual answer to that question is, what's an inode? Well, stick around, I'm going to tell you. A file system can take up a whole disk drive, or you can partition the drive into separate fixed size partitions and create a different file system on each one. You may want to do this if you're going to be sharing your machine with other operating systems such as MS Windows. I'll be getting into that in a few minutes, but right now let's take a look at the structure of the Linux file system. Every Linux partition begins with a boot block. Now this block holds the program that loads up and starts running whenever you first boot the system. Of course you only need to have an actual boot block on one disk partition because booting will always start with the same file system so the boot blocks can be empty on the other drives and partitions but every Linux partition will have a boot block. But there isn't enough waste to worry about. The boot block is very small, only contains a bootstrap program that loads the actual Linux boot program from somewhere else on disk. The boot procedure has several steps to it and we'll be following them in a later lesson. Immediately following the boot block is something called the super block. This has all the fundamental information about the file system. The superblock tells us what kind of file system it is, how much space it has, how much free space is available, the location of the first block of free space, and lots of other bookkeeping information like that. It also contains an indicator that is set whenever the file system is open and active. If there is a system crash, this indicator will remain set and the boot process can check and determine that the system crashed instead of being shut down cleanly. If the system did crash, the boot process will run software that checks the file system and corrects any minor errors. Next comes the inode list. It's made up of nothing more than a long list of disk locations with file size information with each disk location. A file can be located by its index into this inode table. In fact, the name inode was originally index node. Each member of the list holds the address of a block of data on disk. That block contains the data for the beginning of the file and if the file is too long to fit in one block, it will also contain the address of another block on disk to continue the file. A file is daisy chained together this way so it can be dynamically extended if need be. Now you know what that question is all about. If the installation procedure were to ask you how many inodes you would want on the file system, you know that the number you give it will be the maximum number of files and directories that can be put on that system. You see, deep down inside where it really counts, a directory is nothing more than a file that contains a list of entries where each entry has a file name and an index into the inode table. You may never be asked for a number of inodes because with modern file systems and years of experience, the number of inodes is almost always automatically calculated. The rest of the disk, the majority of the drive, contains the data blocks that are allocated and deallocated as files are created, extended, and destroyed. If a file is deleted, that means its inode is no longer listed in a directory and all of the blocks that were allocated to it go back to the free space pool and are available for allocation to a new file. With most of the modern Linux file systems, large files can have extended inode tables that are allocated from the data blocks. When this inode scheme I just described was first invented for Unix, there was consideration for files up to 4 gigabytes in size. In those days, this was an unimaginably large size, and no disk drives existed that would go to that size. Now, however, we've gone well beyond that size, and there's been some tuning in the details of allocating inodes. The basic principle is just as I have described, but some things have been added and made more automatic, not to mention faster and more stable. In fact, the newest Linux file systems are almost completely immune to a system crash. Okay, that's the hardware side of disk drives. The next lesson explains how the disk drives are addressed by the software so you can actually read and write files. Mm -hmm.